just the different uh, ways that church looks in this virtual era. And so um, I'm sure as we've, you know, endured many months going into this, uh, going into this new kind of time in our lives where we've been sheltered in place for so long and with also just um, both the, the uh, anxieties we might feel from watching the news or even dealing with things difficult um, closer to our, our personal lives and to our church. Um, it's really good to be able to gather together. And even if the, the format changes and um, the method changes, uh, it's still so great that we can gather together and um, together remember the hope that we have um, in God's amazing love for us. So we want to sing about that this morning. Um, we want to hear about that from God's word and to see how his word can speak to us today. Um, so let me pray for us as we get going. God, we really thank you for who you are and how much you love us. And um, God, we know that, uh, that as we kind of traverse these crazy times, Lord, um, that over and over again, we get to see, Lord, that um, we don't have all the answers, that we might be powerless, that we might feel so inadequate, um, that we may feel uh, guilty about the ways that we um, are kind of dealing with quarantine life, um, or that we just might feel overwhelmed in our confusion. And God, because of that, we thank you for your amazing love, that there could be a truth that we could anchor our lives around um, this morning and uh, just uh, constantly because you are with us. And so, God, I just pray that as we sing, as we hear your word, um, as we spend this time in a just a unique format of fellowship, um, God, that you would, that we would be blessed by um, your Holy Spirit and your presence with us, and that we would be blessed by the body of Christ and uh, what it means to be a part of your family, Lord. So, um, and I pray that in all that, we would experience your amazing love this morning. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, let's sing together this morning.
to see people's enthusiasm for uh, a great song that we haven't sung in a while and just the power of, of the words, seeing people's words in the chat there. Um, and uh, we may feel we may feel broken in every way. We may feel um, that we are not worthy. And um, that's why singing these words of truth are so important for us this morning. Um, I'd love to teach us a new song. Um, and if we do feel this broken, if we do feel um, that, uh, yeah, we just, we know that we are weak and we know that um, apart from just our Heavenly Father and His great love that um, it's hard for us to do anything sometimes. Um, this next song is called I Am Loved and it's just a really simple, um, it's just a really simple kind of, uh, there's not many lyrics to the song, um, but it's just a great reminder of truth that God loves us. And I know I need to hear that this morning. Um, I'm sure we need to hear that over and over again as we um, navigate uh, just these unique times. And so um, I hope this song uh, just is a wonderful reminder of truth for us this morning.
God, that's why we can sing that you are worthy. And God, when we sing those words, when we say that you are worthy, I pray that we would know that your love and your grace and your kindness and your affection and your acceptance of us is enough. God, even in just very difficult times for us and for our world, God, I pray that we would not lose sight of the joy that you are with us and that you love us deeply. And God, I pray that as we hear from your word this morning, uh, that you would be speaking to our hearts and that we would have open uh, just minds, our, uh, hearts, and ears uh, to hearing your word. We love you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.
Oh, could you uh, make me co-host this one? What's up, everyone? I What's up? <laughs> I want to... This is so cool. I'm I'm really excited to preach on Zoom because like I've been I've been dying recording the videos at home and not being able to kind of see people. So I would love if you would turn turn on your videos. Uh, if you don't, that's fine. But I would love it just so I can see your faces and it's like really special for me to do that. Dude, what's up, Gavin? I haven't uh, seen you or talked to you in a long time. You've grown so much older. Oh my gosh, Gavin. <laughs> You're a, you're a young man now. All right, um, let me pray for us real quick and then we'll get started. Uh, dear Lord, um, I really do pray, Father, that uh, you would speak with power uh, through me, through your word. Um, I pray, Lord, that as we hear you, uh, we would just be able to listen. We'd be able to hear you speak directly to us and um, comfort us, encourage us, speak truth to us. Um, and, and Lord, I pray most of all, Lord, that we would love you and love to listen to you, love to obey you, because you are so lovely and good. Um, so we thank you for um, your people. We thank you for this chance we have to hear from you. In Jesus' name, amen. Alrighty, so we are continuing our series called Being the Body. Um, and, um, okay, there we go, uh, called Being the Body, and we've been going through Acts chapter 2, and kind of talking about the birth of the church, okay? So today we're going to talk about uh, being devoted to the apostles' teaching from Acts chapter 2, verse 41. So a little bit of recap to give some context. Uh, over the last couple of weeks, uh, Dan and I have kind of talked about the context of uh, this section in Acts, and we've been kind of asking this question, how do we define the church? So last week, uh, we talked a lot about how we have false conceptions of the church. We think that the church is a building you go to. Um, we think the church is like a denomination or an organization or whatever it might be. But when you look at the way that the New Testament, uh, the word that it uses to define church um, or translated as church, we see that church is, and at this point, I'm going to ask you, can you define, or can you define what the church is based on last week? Okay, so you can go ahead and put it in the chat. Do you remember? Oh my gosh, I'm so confused by technology right now. Um, can you write in the chat the definition of church that we gave from last time? What do you think? Can you help me? <laughs> How do I view the chat and... Okay, there we go. Let's see. What do we have? Church is a gathering of people. Good job, Grace. A group of people who assemble based on association with Christ, body with Christ. Awesome. So the word church uh, means an assembly, just very generally a group of people who gather together. And so you see in the New Testament that the word church is actually used to describe a group of rioters in Acts chapter 19. So, it, so it's a very general word and the word would have been used to describe a gathering of like people for um, a courtroom, or people to have a political meeting, or people to gather together for any sort of purpose. But then we see in the book of Acts that the church, the way we understand it, has a more narrow definition. And so a church is, uh, I think Peter or Abau, um, that definition is really great. It's a group of people who assemble based on their association with Christ. Um, it is a group, I would, I would say very simply, it is a group of Christians who regularly gathers together and is committed to each other. So a group of Christians. And then last week we asked the question, what is a Christian? And we talked through some of the names of Jesus Christ. We talked about how Jesus is Christ. And that's a term that means anointed one. 
And in the Old Testament, the anointed one was the king. And so Christ is kind of God's Messiah, God's king, who he promised to Israel to restore them to glory. And so Jesus was actually the Messiah, but Israel rejected him. And as a result of that, Peter had to come preach this sermon where he basically says, this Jesus who you crucified, God has actually made him God and King. And so a, a church is a gathering of people who have changed their allegiance uh, to be loyal to King Jesus, okay? And this has a lot of bearing on what we do uh, when we gather together. Because if you think that church is like a production, you watch church, then as I'm talking, you feel like you're a passive observer. Uh, but that's actually not what's going on when preaching happens. When preaching happens, it's actually God speaking to us as the body of Christ, which means that you participate as a listener. And God's word speaks to us, and you aren't just a passive person, you are listening and seeking to hear God and seeking to apply it. And so this whole time we're just going to be talking about what it means to be devoted to the apostles' teaching. Okay, so sorry. Who gathers? Christians. What do they do when they gather? And this is where we're going, for the next part of the series, we're going to look at different kind of activities that Christians do in this passage when they gather. Okay, so if you look at verse 42, Acts chapter 2, verse 42, these Christians, okay, these people gather, Peter preaches about King Jesus, and a bunch of them repent, uh, receive the forgiveness of sins, and are baptized and given the Holy Spirit. And so they become Christians. They are converted to Christianity for the first time, and this is the birth of the church. And then what happens next? They devoted themselves to I mean, to about four things. There's more stuff that goes on in Acts chapter 2, verse 42 through 47, but we can just break it down into four things, and we'll be talking about a few of these in each sermon as we go from here. Um, today, I'm entirely going to focus on the apostles' teaching, okay? So they devoted themselves to what? What do Christians do when we gather together? We devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching. And so... Um, Basically, the first thing we want to understand is, like, what does it mean to devote ourselves to the apostles' teaching? Like, what do they do? What, like, what, what does that mean? The second thing we see is how we do it. And then number three, why do we do it? So really simple, really simple format and structure. Um, what do they do? They devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. How do we do it? We'll see that. And then we'll see why we want to do it as believers. Okay. So uh, let's go ahead and look at this passage, and we're just going to focus on this. Uh, who is the they that devotes themselves? It is the people who received Peter's word and were baptized. And so th there were added to that day about 3,000 souls. Um, and after that, they devote themselves to the apostles' teaching. So I'm going to model for you uh, what it might look like to try to read scripture carefully and unpack what it means. Um, this is something I call slow reading. So uh, everyone talks about speed reading because we like if, if you take if you take a college class or if you take a lot of different classes, um, often the professors will give you like however many thousands of pages to read. And because you have so many pages to read, or honestly, because we have so much information coming at us, we become very practiced at speed reading, which means ingesting as much of the information as possible as quickly as possible. When it comes to reading scripture, I think we should take the opposite approach, where we try to read it as slowly as possible, so we can gather as much nourishment and have as deep of an understanding of what God is trying to say to us as possible. Um, so. Uh, when I was, I, a while back, I was doing Bible study with Eric and Devin, and I would do this thing where I would literally just take one word at a time and try to unpack all of the 
juices out of that one word before going on to the next one. So as we look at what they do when they gather, I'll also be sh modeling for you what it might look like. This is one kind of approach to deeply understanding and listening God's word. There are other really important approaches, like for example, you read a large chunk of scripture and you try to get the main idea. That's one approach. Um, another approach is to go very slowly and get all the juices out of every single word. So let me do this with this passage. Um, so, here we go. And they. So I'm going to stop at they. And when you're reading the sentence, in order to understand the passage, you have to understand who they are. Now, the, do we remember from the context uh, that we read in Acts chapter 2, who are the they that this verse is talking about? Can you go ahead and write it in the chat? Does anyone remember who they are? So in order to know this answer, you have to remember the story. You have to remember what's taking place in this narrative. Um, 3,000 converts, great. Who were the people who were converted to Christianity in this group? Does anyone remember? Israelites? Yeah, so Peter typed Jews from all over. So if you guys are following along in your Bible, um, you can see how there's this actually huge section uh, devoted to saying all the different nations and cultures and languages uh, that were present and represented in the group. So in verse 9, Basically, there are Parthians, Medes, Elamites, Mesopotamians, Judeans, Cappadocia, people from Cappadocia, Pontus, Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya. So it's a huge group of diverse people from different nationalities and languages. And then they were converted by the preaching of King Jesus. And then they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the fellowship, to the breaking bread. So we're remembering all of these super diverse different people were actually able to all do the same thing together as part of this new community that God formed by the preaching of the gospel. Okay, so we kind of understand a little bit better who they are. It's a group of really, really different people who have basically one thing in common, their allegiance to King Jesus, the repentance that they expressed um, where they changed their mind about Jesus and made him their Lord and Savior. They devoted. Okay? We're going really, really slow. And you can really unpack, because uh, a, a huge tendency I see when we read the Bible, or when I observe, pe like myself included, is we speed read, which means you're, you're basically like, oh, I know what the word devoted means, so I just kind of skim over that they devoted themselves. But you don't really... Um, try to unpack and be precise about what the word means. So what do you guys think about, oh sorry, go back. What do you think about when you read the word devoted? You can put it in the chat. Um, what does it mean to devote yourself to someone? What does it mean to be devoted to something? What do you think? To be loyal to? Yeah, I really like that definition. What else? To fully invest in? Oh, what's up, Ethan? Yeah, that's really good. To sacrifice time and energy, to give everything. I really like that. All of these definitions are great. And so first you have to learn kind of what the word devote means. And like if you look at what it means, um, the way we use the word is pretty helpful. Um, that's why they use the word devote when they translate it. Um, it means to like be very concentrated on something, right? Or be very loyal to someone, um, to sacrifice time for someone or something. So if I was to say, I am so devoted to Ashley, uh, but only as long as it doesn't require any sacrifice or effort from me, is that, is that being devoted? <laughs> Or like, I am devoted to Ashley um, as long as I can do exactly what I want and never have to compromise or do anything differently. Is that being devoted? No, no absolutely. Ashley is saying no, it isn't. Um, 
So to and then not only do they devote, they devote what? Themselves. This is really this is really like yeah, this is out of audience participation. Ashley didn't want to sit next to me because she like would feel weird. She's like right behind me over there, but she would feel weird if her face was over here and you could see all her reactions and stuff and she doesn't know what and then sometimes she'll like space out or whatever. So it's very clear that she's spacing out based on how she looks. So she's hiding. Um, so what do they devote? They devote themselves. And, and that's a really big deal. Did you notice what they devote? They devote themselves, which means their person, their whole being as a group corporately, they sacrifice, they are loyal to, they give everything to something. Okay, so we're going really, really slow, but as we're unpacking each word, hopefully we can get a deeper sense of what's going on here. Um, I feel stupid doing slow reading, but it's really good. I think I shall do this. That's great. <laughs> no, I mean, I'm serious, right? Um, and, and honestly, this approach works better for certain types of uh, writings in the Bible. Like for other types of writings, you don't have to do this. Like if you're reading a historical narrative, the Acts is a historical narrative, but um, this part in particular, I really want to unpack slowly. Um, so they devoted themselves to what? The apostles' teaching. Now, as you put this all together, we get a really good picture of what it looks like to devote yourself to the apostles' teaching. Um, and then we're going to see kind of how we do that. But what do they devote themselves? What do they give themselves to? What are they loyal to? The other thing about the word devoted is there's really a sense of like concentrated attention over time. Okay? They concentrated, they gave their attention, and they did it consistently over time. What did they give their attention to? The apostles' teaching. Um, now, who is doing the teaching? The apostles. Who were the apostles? They were the people who Jesus had given authority. Um, who who Jesus who were Jesus' disciple? Yeah, someone who's been authorized by the. Okay, Peter, you're a little too eager. Okay, I would encourage other people to. Peter like immediately answers every time. Um, someone who's been authorized by the risen Lord through witnessing his resurrection. Uh, yeah. So, and they were kind of selected as a group of people who had special authority. And then that authority was kind of validated by God empowering them to preach the gospel and basically lead people and found plant churches and all that stuff. Okay. Now, but when we see that they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching, it actually shows us what the goal is of devoting themselves. And it shows us very, a very important definition of what it means to be devoted. If you, if someone is teaching you something, what is uh, a successful outcome of listening to that person? What do you think? What's a successful outcome of listening to a person teaching? Let's see, put it in the chat. Okay, let me, maybe this is a hard question. Uh, learning? Yeah, sure. Um, is a successful outcome uh, kind of like free associating what it makes you feel? If your focus is to try to learn or devote yourself to someone who's communicating to you, what's the successful definition of that? So let me give you an example. Yeah, to see what they want us to learn, understand. Okay, if Ashley is trying to communicate to me a list of things to buy from Safeway, what is a successful communicative outcome? I mean, I would, I would say you do become like them, but I would, I would, I would see, say it's even more simple. Like, thank you, Sarah. I, Ashley has these thoughts in her brain, like we need eggs and milk. And then she communicates those thoughts through words. Daniel. We need eggs and milk. Yeah, thank you, Ashley. We need eggs and milk. And then I hear it, and then I get the idea that she wanted to communicate, which is that we need eggs and milk. Now, this is so stupidly obvious in one way, 
But I think we don't actually realize this when we read the Bible together. The successful outcome of listening to someone's teaching is to understand and learn the concepts that they're trying to communicate, right? So the apostles' teaching has specific content, and for us to successfully be devoted, we have to listen and learn and understand, right? Um, so, and, and this actually means that there is not, in a sense, sometimes people say there are no bad questions, and sometimes people say there are a lot of different right answers. Uh, when we read scripture, uh, the first thing we want to make sure we get is that we are reading and understanding what they mean. And then once we understand what they mean, then there can be a lot of applications for us. Um, we can kind of contextualize it for our own lives in a lot of different ways. So this is kind of what it looks like to go very slowly through a passage of scripture. This is especially helpful when you're reading uh, the writings of Paul because he writes in this way where he, every single word is extremely significant and often it's hard to understand what he actually means by each word, but they're very, very forceful. If you've ever been like an author or if you've ever tried to communicate something to someone, this is what you want. You have something in your mind that hopefully is clear. It's not always clear. We all know what it's like to listen to someone who, you know, like, I'm not really sure what I'm saying. Like, I think I mean, but then this makes me think about this other thing. And I'm like that some of the times too. But there's a clear thought that you want to communicate. Success in communication is when they hear it and understand it and are able to, like, say back to you what you're saying, right? Um, okay, so th the other thing you see from this, and we're kind of asking the question, what is the apostles teaching? In order to understand what the apostles taught, we can go back to what Peter taught in the sermon. So we see that in Peter's sermon, and we've been reading through this passage like a lot. We've done it quite a few weeks on Sunday. We've been reading through it in Vertigo. We see that Peter is Christ-centered in his teaching. So the primary thing he teaches them is that it's about Christ. The second thing we see is he uses scripture, the old, like the Hebrew scriptures that his audience would have been familiar with. He focuses on those scriptures and explains to them how those scriptures are actually all about Jesus. So he quotes from the Psalms, he quotes from the prophets, and he shows them Jesus is fulfilling these scriptures. And then finally, the apostles' teaching is expository preaching versus topical. We do both types of preaching, and there's good reason to do both. Like, I'm doing sort of a topical sermon right now, where we're focusing on a concept that you see all throughout Scripture, and you're bringing together a lot of different Scriptures to understand it. But the apostles um, would do expository preaching, where they would unpack the meaning of one text. And this actually really informs why, why we do what we do at South Valley. We think it's extraordinarily important and valuable to focus everything we do on reading large chunks of scripture and unpacking them rather than, and, and okay, you guys would really be thankful. You, you should, in, okay, expository preaching can be difficult, but it also can be really, really good. If we were to do topical preaching, uh, there is kind of like a joke among pastors and preachers where they say every preacher basically only has one sermon. And what they mean by that is if you listen to any preacher for a certain amount of time, you realize that they say the same things over and over again, and it all comes across as sounding like the same thing, right? So for, for me, Daniel, I'm like, oh, yeah, you know, I struggled with depression, uh, Alas, Tim Keller even falls into this. Yeah, so the reason we really value expository preaching is because if we are doing our jobs, we are preaching the text and the word of God is so different and every single text is unique and so it should sound different every single time we unpack it. Um, there are lots of common themes, there are lots of common teachings, but every text is unique um, if we do only topical sermons, then a lot of the times they'll come across in the same way. Okay, this is what it means for the apostle to teach. This is what it means to be devoted to the apostle teaching. Okay, so now 
how do we go about this as a church and as a group? And the first thing I wanted to do is just, just encourage you, show up to everything. If you, a lot of the times we feel guilty because we don't do enough quiet time or Bible reading on our own. If that is you, if that's describing you, if, if you are one of the people who has a really hard time doing it consistently every single day, and I would say that um, I fall into that camp, I would encourage you to just show up to everything. Uh, I was looking through our schedule. I was looking back at old emails and old series, and this is what I realized. If you've attended Vertigo and listened to Sunday services every single time since 2017, you will have read together with a group the entire book of, and there, there might be small sections that we didn't explicitly preach on, but I would say you, have, you will have read the vast majority of Genesis, Revelation, Colossians, and Luke. In, in our Sunday services, if you just show up every week, you will be exposed to this huge swath of scripture. And in that way, you are devoting yourselves to the apostles' teaching. You're devoting yourself and your life. You're giving yourself to the word of God. If you just came to Vertigo every single Wednesday since 2017, you will have read most of the book of Matthew. I was looking at our schedule and I think we were on Matthew 4 in January. You will have read all of 1 Peter, 2 Peter, Colossians, Ecclesiastes, and Esther. So we try to give you, in everything we do, a really balanced diet of a lot of different types of biblical literature, Old Testament, New Testament, epistles, poetry, wisdom literature, prophetic, apocalyptic, there's a there, gospels, there's a wide variety of different things. And so just show up, okay? If you have a hard time reading by yourself, that's okay. It takes a long, it, for some of us, we just aren't like that. It's really hard to read by ourselves. So figure out ways to help yourself and to continue to devote yourself. And one of those ways is just by showing up and doing it together with other people. And just kind of like know yourself. Like if you think you're really consistent about your daily Bible reading, here's a question. You think you are, do you actually read the Bible daily? You know what I mean? If you don't, it, you, you might set really ambitious goals. If you don't actually do those things, then like learn from that and say, I need help and then ask for help. And Dan and I are so willing. Okay, me in particular, I'm sure Dan is like this too, but I love reading the Bible with people and I'm so excited. I am like so overjoyed whenever anyone shows any interest in reading the Bible. And so I will do whatever it takes to show you how to read the Bible, to read the Bible with you together with you. And what I would really love is if, would, would be as if as a group, <laughs> okay, our, our puppy is sleeping and she's having like a bad dream or something. So she's making these weird squeaking sounds. It's really sad and distracting, um, but really cute. So if you, um, now I'm totally, I forgot what I was saying. I, I love Bible reading. If you, I will, Seriously, like if you want to learn how to read the Bible, I will spend time reading the Bible with you together so you can do it better by yourself. Um, we can form Bible study groups. This is what I was saying. I would love if as a church, we were people who constantly read the Bible together in groups, um, not just Sunday service, not just Vertigo. If those formats don't work well for you, I would say try your best to show up anyway but also be creative in the way you try to devote yourself to the apostles teaching, which means find people who you want to read the Bible with and read it together. And if you want for a few, for like a week or two, I can join you. I can give you some direction. Um, I can say, Oh, th these are helpful structures you can have to read the Bible together. And then I'll get out of there because I, I don't want to dominate the discussion. I want you to be able to do it yourself. Okay. Uh, let's keep going. Okay. So, Five steps, the how question. How do you do this? How do you devote yourselves to the apostles teaching? You won't believe number five. Um, number one, concentrate. This is like totally simple and obvious, but we cannot take this one for granted. What I mean by that is if I'm listening to Ashley, tell me the grocery list, 
do you know the very first thing I have to do in order to successfully receive her communication? What? I have to actually hear the words she's saying, which means not just totally like ignore her. I have, this is actually like a superpower I have that my parents always would complain about. I can be so extraordinarily focused on something that I block out all other sensory input, okay? So like I would be playing video games when I was a high schooler and my mom would like be right next to me shouting in my ear and I would just, I wouldn't even hear her. I would just be focused on the game because I just focus very intensely. So the very first thing you have to do is concentrate. Um, concentrate on the preaching, concentrate on the text that we're reading through so that you can actually hear it. So, so don't be like Jamba Juice Girl. Um, this is a dumb thing that happened to me during the week. Um, I was going to get uh, Pete's coffee because Ashley's mom gave me a gift card there. And so I was driving through here. There is a girl on the sidewalk who uh, bought Jamba Juice. And basically, so it's, it's, like, it's like in the middle of a shopping mall or whatever, right? So here's the street and I'm going past here to try to park. I see her holding um, a cup carrier with two Jamba Juices and she's on her phone and she's looking down at her phone and I'm driving like this and she's walking like this and you know what she did? She didn't look either direction. She was staring at her phone. She, um, she just went straight out into the street right in front of me and if I wasn't paying attention, I would have run her over. I would have hit her. And, and not only that, there was like a car parked there that was blocking her. So I couldn't, the only reason I saw her coming was because I was paying attention. I saw her go behind that car and I knew that she was just walking. So she was going to come right out and it was like an SUV or whatever. So she was behind it. I couldn't see her at all. And then she popped right out just as I was like going by. And so I had to stop. So this is, I mean, honestly, I want you to ask yourself, um, do you, are you Jamba Juice girl at church? Like when, when we're, when people are preaching and I'm not, do we are by no means perfect. We're not always clear. We can often be boring. We don't always do a good job. You know, things happen during the week, and, you know, whatever it is. Or like last week I preached for like 50 something minutes. That was like way too long, but try your best. Um, pay attention. Like don't space out, figure out what you need to do to pay attention, concentrate. Okay. That's how you devote yourselves. That's how you're loyal. You got to listen. You got to hear, you got to hear what God is saying. Okay. Um, next one, uh, understand just because I hear what Ashley says, just because the sound waves go into my ear and are interpreted by my brain and become words, it doesn't mean I understand what she's saying. This happens all the time when in the, over the course of marriage, like I'll say something to her, she understands the sound waves, she interprets the words, but she doesn't understand what I mean, or I don't understand what she means. And so the second kind of marker for us is when Daniel is talking, do I not only hear him, but do I actually understand what he's saying? Do I understand what scripture is saying? Um, so again, a successful communication is one where one person is thinking something, they say it, the other person hears it, and then they get the same thought or concept or message that the person speaking was trying to communicate, right? So just understand, make, and also know whether you understand or don't. You know what I mean? One great tool for this is can you summarize or restate what I mean or what the Bible means in your own words? That's a really good test to see whether you understand what is going on. Okay, uh, third one, personalize. Um, this is something I actually see a lot when it comes to preaching. Uh, often my, so again, we're not perfect. We can be boring. We can be unclear, all these different things, but this is honestly one of the blockages I see the most for people when they, when it comes to reading the Bible and hearing from preaching, just because you hear it and understand it intellectually does not mean that you know how to personalize it. Okay. 
Um, and this is true for me too. As, as I prepare sermons, a lot of the times I understand the concepts very clearly, but often I ask the question, what does this mean for me, Daniel? And often I have to ask God, like, how do you want this text to speak to me personally? And honestly, sometimes weeks come where I'm not totally sure. Um, I would say I'm trying more and more to make sure I'm asking this question and figuring this out before I preach to people. What does it mean? How do these core truths apply to my life, my situation, my circumstances, whatever it means? Um, and here's another trap that people often fall into. When you listen to me preaching, you're always thinking about the person sitting next to you. You're always thinking about someone else who really needs to hear this sermon. Or, oh, I just wish this person would apply these truths so they wouldn't annoy me so much. But you're not thinking about how it applies to you. Um, you're not thinking about that, right? You guys all know exactly what I'm saying. And this is actually a huge issue we have where we don't realize that the intent behind preaching is for God to speak to you and you to listen and understand and be changed by him and be per personally impacted, okay? So it's not just knowledge. Keep on going. Internalize it. This is like uh, one, in one ear, out the other, where Ashley says we need, what did Ashley say we need? Milk and eggs. Those words come in, I hear them, I listen, I go out the door, I immediately forget the things that she told me to get. Or like, I get to the grocery store and I'm like, what did she say again? Um, how often do we do this with preaching and Bible study, right? Like how many of you, <laughs> and I am equally guilty of this, because I mean, honestly, I don't really care if you remember what I say. Um, I care if you become the type of person who over time, you, internalize big chunks of scripture, which means you know God's word, you've memorized parts of scripture, but even if you haven't memorized it word for word, you can say, you can get the gist, right? And the kind of principles that you get out of scripture, you remember them. And so during the week, um, a girl carrying jam juice cuts you off and you're like, girl, why don't you pay attention? And then I'm like, oh, that girl, I'm gonna like, I'm so mad at her. But then I remember, wait, what, is, what does God say? Um, God says, uh, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, <laughs> even though she's my enemy. I, that doesn't mean I can hate her and be angry. I can actually um, pray for her that she would pay attention and not get hit by other cars, right? Um, that's kind of what it means to internalize God's word and then to actually try to live it out in your everyday life. If you hear a message that really impacts you, or you read a scripture that really impacts you, think how you can remember it during the week. Okay? Think how you can remember it during the week. So if I was to ask you on Tuesday, um, what was that one thing that God said to you from the sermon? Um, would you be able to say that? And often I wouldn't be able to say that when Dan preaches or like if when I listen to my own sermon, I wouldn't be able to, that, I mean, that doesn't count, but um, inter internalize it. Okay, and then look at this. So these principles that I'm saying, I'm kind of like um, getting them from different passages in scripture, and I'm just trying to make a list out of them so it's kind of easier to, to, to digest. But look at this. Um, Blessed is the man whose delight is in the law of the Lord, and on it he meditates day and night. So the word meditate is to like really pay careful attention to read the same thing over and over and over again until it really sinks deep into you. Um, and so, and he does it day and night. So it's like constant. It's a constant habit and part of the thing that he does. And then he also delights in it. So it's not like he's doing it because it's like brushing his teeth and it's good for him. He loves God's word. Um, don't read the Bible because you know it's good for you. Uh, try to delight in his word. Um, and if you're not delighting, then there's probably something going on with you and God that's causing that to happen. Okay, um, fifth one, you won't believe number five. Um, fifth one is do. So if you were to do the first four things and yet you never changed any behavior or action or all the things you learned didn't impact the way you lived at all, 
it would be a massive total failure because this is the purpose of God's word. Um, now, okay, I want to I want to test you. Do you guys remember the story or parable that Jesus tells in the Sermon on the Mount, where he there are two different people who build their houses. One of them builds their house on the rock. The other person builds the house on sand. The storm comes and the guys whose house was built on a foundation of sand is washed away. Do you guys remember the point that Jesus was trying to make? And do you remember who the two different builders represented? They represented two different types of people. Do you remember who those two people were? Uh, put it in the chat. Don't, you're not allowed to look at the Bible, okay? Because <laughs> you did this in Sunday school a lot, right? Or you were probably familiar with this passage for those of you who, the foolish one and the wise one. And do you know what makes them foolish and wise? What do they have in common? If you read verse 24, Jesus says that the wise one was the one who hears my words and the foolish one also hears Jesus's words. So they both hear God, they both understand God, but what differentiates them? The wise one actually does it and the foolish one hears and does nothing. And so, yeah, just do it, right? Now, okay, the reason why I would caution a little bit and say don't always just do it is because you have to do the other steps first too. Like honestly, I think it's really important and I, I value this so much correctly understanding what God's word says. Um, and honestly, that means trying to listen well and understand well. But uh, I, would, I would say also something is, that's true is if you are just trying to do what God says, that attitude is so powerful and it will lead to so much growth and change in your life. Even when I misunderstand what God is saying in scripture, if I try my best to do what I think he is saying, he will honor that and he will use that for my good. Um, the thing that, that's really tragic is if we don't do anything. Um, if, if it just goes one ear and out the other, or even if we understand it deeply, if reading the Bible is just collecting pieces of information or Bible trivia, then that is sad. That's tragic because God's word, he actually gives it to us to reveal himself, to shape us, to grow us. Okay. So five steps to devote yourself to the apostle teaching. And then finally, I just want to see, uh, th and this is kind of the main point. Um, why do we want to devote ourselves to the apostles teaching? And I would say it's not primarily because reading the Bible is useful or good. That is really important. And God's word says that God's word is useful for us. But I would say the primary attitude um, and reason we want to read scripture is what? What do you think? The biggest one is it's out of love for King Jesus. Now this is super duper important. And so I, I, th if, you get, if you guys only get one thing, try to understand what I'm gonna say next. As a church, I want us to turn Bible reading into Jesus listening, okay? So what this means is the five steps that I gave you, if you don't understand why you're doing Bible reading, why we're analyzing and studying, um, then there's really no point. The whole point is that the Bible is actually breathed out by God. The apostles teaching is the means God chooses to communicate to us. And so out of our love for him, we want to listen to him. You guys, are, you, are you guys getting me? The, when we read the Bible, often we just think, oh, I'm supposed to understand what it means. I'm supposed to get the right information out of it so I can say the answer to Daniel when he asked me the question. But really what's happening is God is speaking to you through scripture. And so our main focus should be asking this question, like, Lord Jesus, I love you so much. I wanna hear what you want to say to me because I treasure 
you speaking. I love hearing from you. Help me to listen to you, okay? How does that transform Bible study? Um, one tendency that I am very aware of when I lead Bible study is because of the way God made me, my Bible studies can feel kind of like intellectual. Is that fair enough? Um, it can feel too analytical because I go one word at a time where they devoted themselves. The reason why I do that is because I care so much about correctly understanding what Jesus is saying because I think it is so important. At the same time, that might not be mo the most helpful thing for you. I think it's super duper important and that's why there are different members of the body who approach it different ways. But I would just say, the purpose of analyzing scripture well is so we can listen to God well and understand what he's saying and so we can correctly apply it and live it out. If you misunderstand what Jesus, okay, if you misunderstand some of the things Jesus says, your life will go terribly wrong. Um, there's a part where Jesus says, if your arm causes you to sin, chop it off. Right? If you don't understand what he means by that, then you won't have any arms left. Right? But that's not what he means. And so you have to understand what it means before you're able to live it out. Understand what he's saying to you. And then this changes every single one of the steps from impersonal, like this is a, a practice that I do, to a relationship. When you're listening to the preaching of God's word, do you realize that God loves you so much that he has provided this means by which you can hear from him and receive love and grace and truth from him, okay? Do you realize that? And is that the attitude that you take with you when you listen to Sunday sermons? Or when you sing songs? Like, or when you go to Bible study? When I ask you to concentrate, it means concentrate on Jesus. Like, make sure that he is in your frame of, that you're thinking about him as you're hearing. And then when you're understanding, you're trying to understand him, ask him for help understanding. Try your best to engage actively in every way that helps. When you're, when you're trying to personalize it, you're saying, God, Jesus, my king, how can I hear you? How do you want me to change? What do you want me to do? All of these different things, right? Um, and then we delight in his word. It's treasure. It's precious to us. Um, the more I read and understand scripture, the more I hear from God through scripture, the more I treasure scripture. And I love the Bible so much because it's how I relate to my Lord and Savior. It's how he guides me and talks to me and changes me. It's how he gives me the power to live out what he says. Um, and then finally, we do this all out of a desire to please him. So it's not like a chore. It's not brushing your teeth. It's because we want to listen to him. Like, do I listen to Ashley because I'm like, hmm, I want to be a good husband and I know that I should listen to my wife? Sometimes, yeah. But primarily, I listen to my wife because I love listening to her. And I show her love by listening to her and trying to understand her. Even when it's hard. If I don't understand her, do you know what I do? What did you say? Can you explain it to me in a different way? In the same way, if you love God, if you want to understand him, if you don't understand the first time around, ask people for help. Ask him for help. Like say, God, can you help me understand this? Because I don't really get it. Um, come ask your pastors. Come ask the people you trust to help you explain this section. So I want us to be a group where we run into these questions and then we ask them and we help each other get through them. Okay? Um, so... Uh, we're supposed to do, I, I don't know, I came up with this, like every sermon, I want to do a COVID connection or at least ask the question, how does this passage specifically, um, how can we personalize these the teaching in light of being socially distanced and doing stuff on Zoom? Um, so I don't know, uh, think through for yourself, what struggles do we have in paying attention and listening? And then how can we form habits that help us, oh, sorry, yeah. Um, if you, if you want, 
a, a dumb acronym to remember the points that I said. It's actually Cupid. Did you see that? Concentrate, C, understand, U, personalize, P, I, D. It spells Cupid. You like that? Good job, I know. Um, uh, yeah, that was totally unintentional. At first it was, at first it was, yeah, I know, exactly. You got me, Tammy. At first it was this, it was Cupid. And then I was like, cause the first one was gonna be pay attention. But then I was like, wait a second, I can make this into Cupid. <laughs> so then I changed the pay attention to concentrate. And I think pay attention is better than concentrate, but I wanted to make the acronym. Um, so how as a group can we form habits that help us pay attention to preaching to scripture, even despite techno technological factors? That's a question that I want you all to ask yourself. And in a sense, reflect on your attentiveness and try to do things that help with that. Okay, um, so again, just summing up, they devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. It means giving of yourself and loyally committing to hearing from God through the Bible, through preaching, through Bible study. Um, and it's all for the purpose of listening to the one you love and changing based on what he says to you. Honestly, we pray all the time to God, we speak to him. And some of you might be asking the question, I pray to God, but I never hear him speak back, right? That's an issue we have. Well, here's the answer. The primary way that God speaks to us is through his word. That's not the only way, but the consistent objective way that he speaks to us is through scripture. And then finally, um, Jesus says this really cool thing in John chapter 14, where he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. And what he means there, it's normally translated obey, but the word actually means, if you love me, you will guard my commandments. And then later on, he says, so this is for the disciples, um, Jesus is leaving them. Uh, because he's going to ascend to heaven. And so he's saying, when I'm gone, if you love me, you will keep and guard and remember my commandments. But here's the thing, they don't have to do it all by themselves because later on he says, I will give you the Holy Spirit. I will give you the wonderful counselor who will bring these things to your remembrance. And so out of all these things I'm saying, all the hows, um, I just wanna encourage you, you're not doing it alone. Because if you are a Christian, you have the Holy Spirit and God's Holy Spirit is actually guiding you in the truth and bringing these scripture verses to your remembrance at the times where you really need it. And not only that, you have the body of Christ who can help you pay attention and help you um, internalize these things. And then honestly, the example of other believers in the body of Christ is so important. What does it look like to live out scripture? Um, it looks like Greg. It looks like Grace. And so by being with these people, they show us what it looks like to imitate Christ and be like him through scripture. Okay? So I don't want you to take away from this, read your Bible more. I want you to take away from this, um, realize as you're reading your Bible or listening to preaching, that God is personally speaking to you and then try to understand what he's saying. This is where the joy of the Christian life comes from, from trying to discern what God is saying to me so that I can live it out. And then as I obey him, seeing how great it is to do that and then doing it more and more together as a group. Okay. They devoted themselves to the apostles teaching. Let's pray. Yeah, Lord. Um, I pray, God, that you would help us to um, hear what you would have us hear from your word. Um, I pray, Lord, that you would be bringing to mind uh, whatever you wanted to say to us this week, um, and that, Lord, we would be able to faithfully listen to you. I pray for people who might be unsure um, of their relationship with you, uh, I pray for people who might just really struggle with hearing from you, um, with hearing from your word, uh, that you would be helping them 
and that we as the body of Christ would be coming alongside them to uh, help each other hear from you so that we would be more and more like you. So we as the body of Christ would manifest your love and unity and grace for each other, but also for all the people who don't know you. I really pray, Lord, that we would be a people who are so devoted and loyal and self-giving and sacrificing to your teaching and your word that it would change us and so that we might have the peace and joy and experience of love that you promise. We love you. Pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. Alrighty. Oh yeah, that's a really good point. I like that. So um, we are going to sing one more song and then we'll close. Uh, here's another thing. I meant to do a QA time, but I talked for too long. So if you have any questions, please um, message me. Like you could put them in the chat. You can ask me or Dan or anyone anytime. We'd really love to do that. And if you want to read the Bible and need help reading the Bible, please let us know. Okay? All right. Thanks, Daniel. Um, what a yeah. What an encouraging uh, and powerful reminder of why we want to hear from God's Word, not just to emphasize that it's something we need to do, but it's a way where we get to know more of God's love for us and see how he's with us and just um, see how he as the son of God and our savior um, can really guide us in such a great way. So as we sing this one last song, uh, we really want to um, cry out to God and ask, what does it look like that we would be um, able to be firm, able to have a solid, uh, a life that's built upon the rock as Daniel was saying from Matthew chapter seven. So let's sing this last song together.
this our prayer that we would really build our lives around this firm foundation. I will build my life upon your Open up my eyes in 